Hey, good morning. You guys survived the tundra that was outside? I, we were like finishing up the sermon and I looked outside and I'm like, oh my gosh, nobody's going to be here next service. So you all are the faithful, the good who are here. Glad that you're here with us. Uh, my name's Josh, whether you're visiting with us for the first time or you've called River Tree your home for a while, we're just so glad that you're here and happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we are so thankful for all of our veterans, all of our servicemen and women. Can you give a round of applause to them? Um, You know, one of the things I'm reminded of often um, is that uh, our ability to be able to gather together, study God's word, uh, that's not something we should take for granted, right? Because there's places all around the world uh, where that is not the case, where the church is meeting and secretively in homes. And so I'm so thankful for our servicemen and women who've provided an environment where we can gather together, be encouraged together, it means so much. I heard this story uh, the other day about Memorial Day. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but Memorial Day was born out of uh, necessity. After the American Civil War, we had uh, roughly 600 to 800,000 um, men and women who had died as a, as a result of the Civil War. And so all of these Union and Confederate soldiers uh, were having to be buried and honored. And so Memorial Day uh, started officially at, at Arlington National Cemetery, May 30th, 1868. Uh, and both Union and Confederate soldiers were buried at Arlington. But I don't know if you know this or not, I found this story out. Uh, a few years ago, they found these archives where uh, they, they saw these early celebrations of Memorial Day, and, and one of them happened in 1865, right after the Civil War had finished. On May 1st, 1865, a few months after the Civil War had come to completion, uh, there was a group of freed black uh, slaves uh, less than a month after the Confederacy surrendered, and this group of 10,000 of them, along with white missionaries in Charleston, South Carolina, they went on this parade through the town, and they celebrated and honored all of uh, the, the lives who had been lost throughout the Civil War. Members of the 54th Massachusetts and other black Union regiments were in attendance performed double time marches, black ministers recited scripture verses as they celebrated and honored those lives. But, but here's the deal, for, for so long, for over 100 years, we didn't know about this. We didn't know about this story. And so uh, one of the historians, David Blight, who's a professor at Yale, he, he said this about the story. He said, this story that had really been suppressed both in local memory and national memory, but, but, but here's the deal. Nobody who experienced it, like they saw it with their own eyes, nobody who was there ever forgot it. I mean, every single one of us could say, man, there's stories like that that are powerful, stories that change us, right? I think back to my own life and there are stories, there are things that have shaped me, formed me, changed me. And so we're starting this series called The Moral of the Story where basically we're saying we want to look at, you know, a, a couple of stories throughout the Bible that have this way if we're open, if we're receptive to changing us, teaching us, transforming us, if we're open to that. And the stories are powerful. They have this way of connecting where we're at and calling us to something deeper. And so we're gonna look at some of the stories, this series, and today we're starting off with the story of a guy named Joseph. Anybody here heard of Joseph? Go ahead and nod your head, you heard of Joseph? Joseph's story is crazy. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. So I'm excited to look at it with you. If you've got a Bible, open up to Genesis 37. We're going to pick up in verse 3. We're going to dive right in. If you don't have a Bible with you, you're going to see the scriptures on the slides in front of you. But I'm going to hop right in. Genesis 37, verse 3. It says, Now Israel, um, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of the rest of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Any favorites in the room? Go ahead, raise your hand for your favorites in your family. No favorites in this room? What? Come on. I know that in a room this size we got favorites. So his brothers are looking at him and they're going, oh, why is he treated different than the rest of us? Now, Joseph has this dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him all the more. Now, I want to give you some advice. If you're a favorite, do not do what Joseph does, okay? So Joseph says to, to his brothers, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright when your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, 
Are you saying that you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream, what he said. Basically, he said, there's going to come a time where I'm going to reign over you. And all of the older brothers, how do you think they responded to that? Not so kindly, right? Just some tips and tricks. Don't do that. But Joseph had a lot going for him early in his life. When I mean, you think about it, Joseph was the, this, this chosen child, this favorite child of his father, Jacob. He had been given this ornate robe different than any of the other siblings he had. Imagine this, right? Imagine that you're a kid, you've got 10 siblings, right? And your 10 siblings for Christmas, they get a slinky and you get an iPad, right? How would that go well, right? Pretty bad. Imagine you're a parent and you have 10 kids and you're like, no, I'm speaking against that. 10 kids, like I'm gonna be poor forever, right? But imagine you got 10 kids, you're giving slinkies out to them, you give an iPad to one. That's what's happening in this family. It's dysfunctional, it's crazy. There's this clear favoritism, but Joseph had these dreams. He had these aspirations. He thought life was going to be amazing. He had these images from God. He was like, oh, this is what life is going to be like. But then we see something happens. Things were looking up for Joseph, but underneath the surface, jealousy and anger were brewing in his family. And we see that the, this begin to rise to the surface in Genesis 37. One day, when Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers. So uh, his, his dad says, I want you to go check on the other boys. He goes out there to check on his brothers, but the unthinkable happens. His brothers beat him up, they strip him of his cloak, and they throw him into a pit, leaving him for dead. Reuben, one of his brothers, shows up. He hadn't been there at the time, and he shows up and he goes, what are you doing? We can't leave him here in the pit, he's our brother. And so they come to this compromise. You tell me if you think this compromise is fair. They come to the compromise, we won't leave him there for dead, we'll just sell him into slavery, right? Doesn't that sound like a fair compromise, right? So they sell him into slavery, and guess how much he was worth? 20 pieces of silver. Imagine the betrayal that Joseph felt. He'd been thrown into a pit, had these huge aspirations, huge dreams, thrown into this pit, sold for 20 pieces of silver from his own family. And here's what they do. The, the brothers come back. We've got, we got to find a story, right? Because Jacob's going to start asking what happened to Joseph. And so they take this cloak that they had stripped from Joseph and they cover it with animal's blood and they bring it back to their father. They say, oh, this, this wild beast, you know, killed Joseph. And obviously Jacob is torn. He's grieving. He's crying because his child that he had in old age is dead. See, for those of you thinking your life is a mess, right? Your family's a mess, right? Hopefully this can encourage you a bit, you know? You go, well, at least we wouldn't do that, right? But notice how the story continues, you know? We, we see this, right? He, he feels like this overwhelming betrayal of his family. How many of you, how many of you have heard of the Choose Your Own Adventure books? Go ahead, raise your hand if you've heard those books. I had those books as a kid. I don't, I don't know if you ever had those, but basically, let, let me give you a, a SparkNotes version of this. These books sold 250 million copies. That's a ton of copies. But here's basically the premise of the book. You'd have this adventure, right? You'd read the book, and it comes to this point where you as the reader were able to choose what you wanted to happen. So you could get to this point, and you could go, I'm going to turn to page 67, and this is going to happen. I'm going to go on this adventure, or I can turn to page 92, and I'll go down this adventure. And you as the reader had the choice of what you wanted to do. I, mean, I imagine, right, before all this happened with Joseph's family, I imagine that Joseph felt this way. Like Joseph was the favorite. He was clearly his father's favorite. He had these dreams and visions. He thought, you know what? I can choose whatever. He was like the valedictorian in high school. It was like, I could go to whatever school I want. I could pursue whatever I want. My life has open options. All I got to do is choose. But then that dream gets turned upside down, right? Yeah, here's the deal. There's a reason why the Choose Your Own Adventure books are children's books. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why probably not you're not reading the Choose Your Own Adventure books as an adult. Because as adults, we know that's not how life works. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if it did? But it just doesn't. Sometimes you don't get to choose your own adventure. All of us start off thinking, here's the story that I want to be written for my life. Here's the options. Here's the plans. We start off with certain dreams. But like Joseph, life has a way of throwing them into a pit and leaving them for dead. What happens when our life doesn't look as we pictured it? Anybody else experienced that before? 
where you have these dreams and images. This is how my marriage will look like. This is how our finances will look like. This is how our kids will act like. All these things, this is exactly how it's going to be. And then life just has this way of throwing it in the pit. It just discouraged, disheartened. That's how Joseph felt. Genesis 39, verse 1 says, Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. But notice this, this is important. This is all throughout the story. The Lord was with Joseph. So everywhere he went, he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord had given him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes of his master, became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his whole household and trusted him with everything. So even though this dream that Joseph had seemed to turn upside down, God was with him through it all. Every step of the way, every single turn, every single obstacle, God was with him. In the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of the betrayal, in the midst of the mixed feelings, God was with him. God was for him. Was continually walking with him every single step of the way. God was preserving him, providing him, pulling him from a pit, placing him into a palace, right? You would have thought he arrived. But then life happens again. We see this, right? Potiphar's wife was attracted to Joseph. And she had made numerous attempts to get with Joseph, and Joseph always resisted him. He was trying to be a man of integrity. He was trying to be fair. He was trying to, to serve his master, to serve his God. And so every single time he would say no, he would avoid. But every single time he denied, Potiphar just got more and more frustrated. And eventually she lies and says that Joseph raped her. How do you imagine that Potiphar responds? Of course, he's angry. So he takes Joseph and he throws him into prison. Isn't that how life pans out sometimes? Aren't there times where the hits just keep on coming and you can't seem to catch a break? You know, maybe it's just when you're making progress on your credit card debt, right? You're like trying to make progress. You're like, we want to be debt free. We want to be debt free. And then all of a sudden your car breaks down. 2,000 bucks to fix it. Like, oh, we're worse than where we began. Or, or maybe for you, there, there's this dynamic in your family and you feel like things are getting better. You're like, oh, things are getting healthier. They're getting healthier. Things are getting better. But then all of a sudden, there's this moment, there's this outbreak, right? And you go, we're exactly where we were at. Maybe for you, you just feel like, you know what? We're on the other side of this, right? The circumstances, the, the things that happen, we're on the other side of this. We're not in the midst of it. We're on the other side. But then all of a sudden, something happens, and all the fear and anxiety that you had that moment rushes back in. You feel paralyzed. How many of us have said this? Let's just be honest, right? How many of us have said, if I could just get through this season, right? Anybody say that before? I'll tell you right now, we're trying to get Elsie to sleep in a big girl bed, and she always wants to get out of that bed. And I'm like, if we could just get through this season, right? If I could just claim the promise that God gives me, then I will sleep at some point. Let's claim it, right? If we could just get through this season. But it feels like, if we could just get to this, this next season, it always feels like that's a faint memory or vision. It makes it be hard to get there. See, when, when your dream gets turned upside down, when you feel like the promise is a faint memory, when life doesn't look as it's pictured, it is easy to give up on the dream, to give up on the promises from God, the desires that God has for your life. It's easy to give up on it. I don't know about you, but if I'm Joseph, I'm giving up, right? I was favored. And then I was sold into slavery. I was the favorite slave, and, and now I'm in prison, right? At some point, I would go, this just isn't working out for me. God says he's with me, but this just isn't working out, so I tap out. I'm done. But that's not how Joseph responds. Notice what it says here. Genesis 39, verse 20. But while Joseph was there in prison, say it with me. Ready? The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who were held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything that he did. Just to give you the Spark Notes version here, right? Joseph goes from favored son to slave, then favored slave to prisoner. He's sitting in prison. And I imagine he's, I don't know if God's with me, but 
But God is continuing to provide for him all of these moments, all of these provisions in the midst of it, all of it, the roller coaster of his life, the highs and lows where he's felt like he needs to tap out and give up. God has continued to provide for him in the midst of it. And through this series of events, God gives Joseph this opportunity to interpret dreams of some of the people around him. And one of the people who's got this dream that they can't figure out is Pharaoh himself. Because of his wisdom, we read in Genesis 41, 39, that Pharaoh tells Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You will be in charge of my palace and all my people are submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh entrusts all of Egypt, this huge nation, the biggest nation he could ever experience. He entrusts all the leadership into Joseph's hands. He's gone through this roller coaster where he lost everything, gained some of it back, lost everything, gained some of it back, and now he's at this point where God had this dream for him. And it had come to fruition that he had reached this spot in leadership and life, that the journey had led him to this point. And something happens. Soon thereafter, a famine spreads throughout the land. All of these neighborhoods, all of these nations, all of these regions, there's famine, and people are searching for food, and they're searching for water. They have no idea where to go, so all of them start flocking to Egypt. They go, they must have food, they must have water. Guess which family shows up in Egypt? Joseph's family. They're hungry, they're thirsty. Now, mind you, these are the same people who had sold him for 20 pieces of silver, who left him in a pit for dead, who sold him into slavery, who lied about his death. Those people were showing up, and they were showing up to Joseph, and they needed some help, right? Well, isn't that convenient, right? So Joseph has all this power. He can choose exactly however he wants to respond. He could say, you know what, I want to kill them, I want to shun them, I want to embarrass them, I want to send them back with nothing. He has all this power, all of this choice. He can choose his own adventure when it comes to his family now. But instead of all those things, he chooses compassion. And he and his family are reunited. He's reunited with his dad. And the dream that God had given him as a 17-year-old kid, this dream that, that God had put like a seed in his, in his heart, in his mind, as a 17-year-old kid was now fully coming to fruition. And he was able to see how that journey, the highs and lows of life brought him to this point. Not that he would be sitting in power, but that he would be able to provide and save so many lives. To be the person who was able to be an advocate for even those who hurt him. And Joseph tells his brothers, and I got to tell you, I love this verse. I hope that, that you love this verse as much as I do. Joseph tells his brothers, Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, the promise that God had given to Joseph had finally been fulfilled and what was intended to harm him. You ever been harmed? You ever been hurt? All the things that Joseph carried with him, all the pains, all the wounds from his family, all the betrayal, God took it and used it for good to bring his dream to fruition. So what's the moral of this story, right? What do we have to learn from Joseph's story other than be really kind of leery about family, right? Can be standoffish, right? Yeah, you know, here's what I see. When the moments and the snapshots and the circumstances of life seem bleak, it's easy to give up on your dream. It's easy to give up on the promises that God has made you. But here's the truth. Moments, snapshots, and circumstances aren't an accurate picture of whether God's dream for your life has come to fruition. When I'm in the moment and it feels so big, when I'm in this season and it feels so overwhelming, those snapshots, those moments, they have such a power over us, but that is not an indicator of whether or not God's promises for our lives are coming true. You know, I, I have this illustration. Are you guys going to be okay if I do an illustration with you real quick? All right, you know, I felt like we needed a mascot here at the church. 
So I decided to get a plant, and I wanted that plant to fully come to fruition by the time that we're done here. Is that okay? Are you guys awake? Come on now. You just like went through a tundra and you're here. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? You didn't blow away, right? So here's what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to just plant a seed and basically have it grow while I'm here. And here's what I chose, okay? How many of you love watermelons? Anybody love watermelons? I love watermelons. It's like summertime. I love watermelons, right? So I wanted to just plant a watermelon seed and figure we, you know, we could pass this thing out, right? Everybody could leave with a little bit of food for them, all right? So I'm going to plant this real quick. Okay. So I'm going to pour some dirt on, and then I'm going to pour some water on, put some light on, and we're going to see this thing grow. Okay, you guys ready? Okay, are you guys ready? You guys seem really excited. All right, you do, I can tell. All right, all right, let's try this, all right? I want you to say, ready, set, go with me. Okay, you guys ready? Ready, set, go. Hmm. Maybe defective seeds, right? All right, let's try this. Um, could you do a drum roll with your feet? Go ahead and do a drum roll with your feet. All right, you guys ready? Here we go. Come on now, come on. All right, you guys ready? Ready, set, go. Hmm. How about this? How about you guys, can you guys wish this to come true? Go ahead. Just wish a watermelon to show up right here, okay? You guys ready? Wish it. Ready, set, go. Hmm. We need some new seeds, right? Wouldn't it be amazing if things just happened in an instant, right? If that watermelon just came in an instant, right? If I could just say, ready, set, go, and then it was there. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, when I look at Joseph's story, one of the things I see is that some of God's most meaningful dreams and desires for our lives take time to come to fruition. I want to say that again. Some of God's most meaningful dreams for your life some of God's most meaningful desires for your life, for your marriage, for your family, for your kids, for your neighborhood, they take time to come to fruition. I think about this in parenting. I, you know, I, how many of you are parents? Go raise your hand if you're a parent. Yeah. So I think about this with parenting, right? I'll think about it this way, right? You know, I'll have a really good day being a dad with Elsie, right? I'm like, I just fully invested my life into LC. You know, I'm like, I'm there, I'm attentive, I'm present, I'm loving, I'm caring, I'm all the things. I'm just pour, pouring myself out today. But am I going to see the dividends of that in a day? Of course not. Right? I can't just do a day and go, oh, I was a really good dad for a day, so they're going to be awesome kids forever, right? It's not going to how it happens. Wouldn't it be amazing if that was the... You sell that, I'll buy it. I don't even care if I got to do a second mortgage in my house, I'll buy it, right? Think about it this way, right? I started showing up to the gym a couple weeks ago. Kurt, one of our elders, was there, and he told me, he looked at me. He did this. He looked up, down, up at me, okay? And he's like, you need to stretch, which I felt like he was fat shaming me as I was walking into the gym. That's another topic for another day. But, right, I'm trying to be healthier, trying to eat healthier, trying to go to the gym, all these things, right? And so I go, and I'm on the rower for 20 minutes. 20 minutes is a long time. I'm feeling muscles I never felt before, right? I'm like, ooh, ow, oof, right? 20 minutes of rowing. I do chest press. I do leg press, right? I'm like walking out of the gym. I'm like, all right. And then I go into my bathroom. I look in my mirror, and I'm like, where is it, right? <laughs> I was, I mean, I wasn't expecting to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I was expecting to lose 40 pounds like that. Like, why? Why couldn't it just happen in a moment? Well, here's the deal. Some of God's most meaningful dreams and desires for our lives take time to come to fruition. You know, here's, here's what I just want to challenge you real quick. Because here's what I see. There's a lot of times where we go through the highs and lows that Joseph does. We experience the good days and the bad days. We experience the good years, the bad years. We experience the good decades. And we know what those decades that are really rough look like. 
And in the midst of the valley, in the midst of the prison, in the midst of the pit, you know what's really easy to do? It's to give up. Like to give up on the dream that God has given us. God has given us these promises to give up on those promises just to say things won't change. It's not going to get better. It's just the way it is. All these things. And so you know what? A marriage takes a turn for the worse. Financial picture looks bleak. Job opportunity falls through. You feel like you're failing as a parent and you just want to give up. You just want to be done. Tap out. Wave the white flag. All of those things. And I get it. I get it because I've been there. Where I go, you know what? When you are in that situation that feels bleak, when you're, you, you look at the snapshot of your life and it doesn't feel like things are panning out, I know what it's like to just back down, concede. But if I may for a moment give you a word of encouragement, I just want to give you a word. And this is the word, persevere. Can you say the word persevere? Can you say it like you mean it? Go ahead, try it again, right? Persevere. 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 Galatians 6, 9 tells us this, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know, I like how Paul Miller puts it in his book, A Praying Life. He says, often we think that everything has gone wrong, but it's just that you're in the middle of a story. I think there's some of you here and you're tempted to give up. I think there's some of you here and you feel like tapping out. I think God's given dreams and desires to every single one of you. Every one of you, whatever season of life you're in, whatever you're dealing with, whatever obstacles are in front of you, I believe that God has those desires for your life, those dreams for your life. But I believe like Joseph, you can be tempted to have those squelched out by opposition. Because it just doesn't seem like the seed is growing as quickly as you want. Because it doesn't seem like the, the, the picture you have for your life is lining up to all the pieces. And I get that. But the challenge I want to give you is don't wave the white flag of surrender. You might be stripped of your coat. You might be thrown into a pit. You might be falsely accused. You might want to tap out. You might want to give up. But my encouragement to you is don't give up because it might be that you are in the middle of your story and not the end. Amen? that God is working through the process to bring about the dream, to bring it to fruition, it might just mean that you've got to persevere. You've got to push through. You've got to take those steps, those faithful steps, every single day trusting that God is with you through it all, exactly like he was with Joseph. The, the dreams that God has given for your life, don't throw them away. Don't discard them. Don't throw them into the pit. Those are from God. Persevere. Be strong. Be courageous. Not because you have all this courage in and of yourself, but because you have a God who is courageous and is with you through it all. You know, I don't know where you're at right now, but I do know what it's like to feel like I'm giving up. And so we're going to do this response. This is a little exercise I want to encourage. Go ahead, servers, go ahead and come forward. They're going to come forward. They're going to hand you uh, an envelope. Um, and no, we're not taking a second offering, so don't freak out, right? Some of you are like, whoa. That picked up real quick. I want you to take an envelope. You're going to see on the envelope that there is this date a year from now, May 26, 2020, okay? So go ahead and grab an envelope. Just hold it in your hand right now. And maybe you're here and you know, it just feels like the, the promises from God aren't coming to fruition or they're not coming to fruition as quickly as you thought. Maybe it feels like the dreams that you had for your life when you were 17. The dreams that you felt like were from God, it's just they've been thrown in a pit and discarded of. Maybe you're in a season where the promises are delivered. You've seen it, you've experienced it, you're filled with joy, you're filled with contentment. Maybe you're still hopeful, but things are taking longer than you hoped. So here's what I want you to do. Um, ben, you guys going to come on up. Ange and Paul are going to come on up. They're going to sing a song called Seasons. It's a great song that reminds us of this truth. That some of God's greatest desires and plans for your life take time. They take time to come to fruition. And while they're singing this song, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to stay seated as they sing. And you're going to see in that envelope this white card, this white blank card. Here's what I want you to write on it. 
I want you to just take some time prayerfully to write down some dream or desire that God has placed on your heart for your life. However small, however big, whether it has to do with your marriage, has to do with your family, has to do with your finances, has to do with your workplace, whatever it is, I want you to write down that dream. For some of you, you might need both sides of that card. Take the time. We're just going to take some time right now and just write down those dreams. And here's what I want you to do. After you get done with that, I want you to listen to the song and I want you to seal that. And here's the hard part, all right? I'm asking you not to open it for a year. That's pretty hard, right? Because here's what you're going to be tempted to do. You're going to have a really good day and you're going to open it up. You're going to go, oh, yeah. And then you're going to have a really hard day the next day. You're going, oh. I want you to take a year, put it on your dashboard, put it on your desk. Just put it somewhere, somewhere where you're going to recognize it. Maybe put it in your Bible. I know that's what I'm going to do. Put that card in my Bible. And a year from now, I'm going to see the way that God, through time, has delivered in small and big ways to the dream and promises that he's given to me. So my, my hope for you is that you're challenged by this, that you're challenged to deeper perseverance because of who God is, that you're encouraged by this, that God is with you the same way he was with Joseph, that God is with you in the midst of the valleys, that he is with you on the mountaintops, and the dreams that God has given you, don't throw those away, don't waste them discard of them. Persevere. Be strong. We're going to have our, our band sing. I encourage you to jot those dreams down, seal it up, and just listen to the music as we take a next step.